All right, picking it up where we left off, uh, small space gardening. Um, just some starting guidelines. As I said earlier, you know, don't try to do too much too soon. Don't try to have about 10 raised beds and thinking it's all going to work out. You know, because if it doesn't work out the first time, you'll easily be discouraged and you won't want to do it again. So start with just a few, uh, single raised bed or a single container. And if that works out, expand to a second one. And if that works out, do a third one and just grow it slowly. Second, it, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, only plant what you like to eat. You know, if there's, I mean, Brussels sprouts, I'm sure, are a wonderful vegetable. And to all those who want to plant them, you can plant them with abandon. You will never find them in my garden because I personally cannot stand them. So, you know, don't let your idiot brother-in-law or whatever try to talk you into planting something just because it's the latest superfood that he's read about in some internet uh, publication. If you don't like it, don't plant it. Plant what you like. Third, now I know gardening is supposed to be a fun hobby and it's supposed to be relaxing, but you still got to do a little bit of homework. So don't put anything in your raised bed or in your container if you don't know anything about it. And by that I mean know what it needs to grow, know how much it spreads, know how tall it gets, because you don't want to be stuck with something that's going to be haunting you for the rest of your, uh, your gardening life. In other words, for example, don't plant mint in a small space garden because the mint will spread and take over and you will never get rid of it. Um, I once planted a Jerusalem artichoke, uh, nine tuber pieces, and they grew. And after they grew, I started reading about them. And I will always remember what I read. The Jerusalem artichoke or sunchoke in the sunflower family. And I thought, sunflower, uh-oh. And sure enough, with stems as thick as my wrists, and oh my lord, were they prolific. I dug bagfuls of tubers out of there, and then come the following spring, I discovered the ones that I'd missed because they started to sprout. It took me a good three years to clear them all out of the garden, but if I had taken the time to learn a little bit about them, I never would have planted them. So know the characteristics of what you're sticking in the ground in your raised bed or your container before you put it in there. And lastly, in order to have a successful garden, you're going to need about six to eight hours of sun per day, preferably more towards the eight side of the range. But if you're not getting that much sun, then you're just not going to get a lot of uh, produce out of it. Now, if you're growing leafy greens, they can stand a little bit less sun. But if you're growing anything that produces a fruit, a tomato, a cucumber, an eggplant, you're going to need as much sun as you can get. As I mentioned earlier, you're going to need at least six to eight hours of sun, and you're not going to get very good quality vegetables without it. Now, where are you going to find enough sun? Here are just some areas that you can plant a small space garden where you can get the maximum amount of sun. You know, a balcony, a stoop, if you have a patio, if you're able to put it on your rooftop, that's a great place to put a garden if you have access to one and you don't have to worry about falling off. As I mentioned earlier, the soil in, your, <clears throat> in the ground in your home is not going to be very good for a, a small space garden. Regular garden soil is hard, blocky, full of weeds and diseases. You're not going to have very good ses success with that kind of soil. So buy yourself a pre-made, a pre-mixed uh, potting mix, or you can even mix up your own. And here's a little recipe for making your own soil. It's basically one part, either peat moss, humus, or leaf mold, one part garden loam, one part uh, builder sand. Note, don't use child's play sand. It's too fine. A little organic fertilizer. And if you're going to grow tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, or any of these others, you want to add half a cup of each of what we have here. And by the way, um, I'll be sending out a handout to Betsy, which she'll, she'll send out to everyone. So much of this information will be in that handout. So if you don't get this in your notes, you'll have it later. <clears throat> water. Water is always important, no matter what kind of garden you have. You can, um, in a raised bed or a container garden, 
The thing that you got to remember is because you have less volume of soil, it's going to dry out a lot more. So you're going to be watering a lot more frequently than you would an in-ground garden. But there are ways you can make your watering chores a little bit more efficient and a little easier. You can install a drip irrigation system. You can set up uh, a sprinkler timer so that it automatically turns it on and turns it off for you. Or you can use self-watering planters. They're basically planters that have a water reservoir that you fill up and it waters the plants from the bottom and you only have to fill them up say maybe once a week as opposed to just a regular container or raised bed that you have to do once a day. All right, let's talk about some techniques for making the most of your limited space now that we're done with the preliminaries. First one I want to talk about is square foot gardening. Square foot gardening is described in great detail in the book that you see here by Mel Bartholomew. Square foot gardening, in a nutshell, is a form of intensive gardening in which the garden is marked off into one foot by one foot squares, as opposed to planting in long rows like you would in a traditional garden. The idea is that by planting in these square foot blocks, you can make much better use, much more efficient use of the space that you have, much more efficient than you would if you planted in traditional rows. Now to build a square foot garden, it's very simple. All you do is get some untreated lumber, either two by fours or two by sixes, cut them into four foot three inch lengths, nail or stake the ends together to create a square with an inner area of four feet, divide the square into 16 equal squares using strips of wood or string as a divider. And here are some examples of how that can work. Here's an example of a square foot garden. As you can see, you've actually got some one foot squares marked off with different amounts of seeds. And the amount of seeds you're going to put in each square will depend on the size of the plant. And I'll show you that in just a little bit. But here's, you know, they've, it's been marked off into larger sections for some larger plots. Here's a more traditional square foot garden. You can see that it's marked off into equal, semi-equal square foot blocks. And probably like in section A here, they're planting maybe a single tomato or a single, um, um, why can't I think of the name, lemon verbena or something like that. Whereas maybe in D, they're planting something like carrots or beets or whatever, you can cram a whole lot more in there. So you can see you're getting a lot in in this section, in, in, this, in this four foot garden, more than you would if you tried to plant all these by rows. Here's a third uh, example of a square foot garden. Here, they're probably growing something like a single tomato, whereas over here, they're growing some smaller crops. <clears throat> so here's, an, uh, here's kind of the way you allocate your individual squares. So you can see that in a square where you're only going to have one, that's when you're going to plant something that's a little bit bigger, like a tomato, a pepper, an eggplant. That requires a little bit more space. So in that one foot by one foot area, you're only going to put one seed or one plant. If you wanted to grow, <coughs> you know, all the way, say, down here, if you're growing beets or carrots or green onions or radishes, you can put a lot more in that one foot by one foot uh, square area. So when you put it all together, you are making the maximum use out of your small space. So that's square foot garden. I, mean, I, could, I could do a whole presentation just on that alone, but you get the idea. If you want more details, I recommend Mel, Mel, Mel Bartholomew's book. He released a second book called uh, The All New Square Foot Gardening. I've heard people say that the first book was better, but it certainly doesn't hurt to read both and then just make the most out of whatever information fits you best. Okay, raised bed gardening. That's the second technique for making use of your small space. So what is raised bed gardening? Raised bed gardening is simply a system of gardening by which the soil is formed in three to four foot wide beds, which can be of any length or any shape. The soil is raised above the surrounding soil, like six inches to waist high. It's sometimes enclosed by a frame made out of wood, rock, concrete blocks, and enriched with compost. So you see the soil here, this is your ground level. 
and the soil here is raised above the ground level, hence the name. The vegetable plants are spaced in geometric patterns, much closer together than a conventional row garden, a conventional in-ground garden, and the spacing is such that when the vegetables are fully grown, their leaves just barely touch each other. So they kind of create a microclimate in which the soil moisture is conserved and weed growth is suppressed. Now, raised beds tend to warm up quicker than, uh, than the surrounding soil. That's one of the advantages of raised beds. You know, once again, I always ask the question, what's in it for you? Why grow a raised bed garden? And here's reason number one. You can get your garden started a little earlier in the spring because the soil is raised above ground level. It's going to warm up a little sooner as opposed to just the regular cold, cold clay. You've got much better drainage because you've got a better soil mix. It's not going to compact like clay, so the water isn't going to gather and stay there. It'll drain out a lot quicker. You don't have to worry about soil compaction because you're not stepping into it like a big backyard garden. Furthermore, you can have individual raised beds with different soil compositions depending on what you want to plant. If you're a gardener, if you, let's say you not only want to plant vegetables, you also want to plant blueberries. Well, blueberries require a more acid soil than your typical vegetable garden. If you try to plant blueberries inside along with your, or I should say inside your vegetable garden, nobody's going to be happy. It's either going to be too alkaline for the blueberries or too acid for the vegetables. But with individual raised beds, you can grow a vegetable garden bed where you have the soil adjusted with just the right acidity for the veggies, and then a second bed that you can make even more acidic for the blueberries, and everybody is happy. It takes a little bit of work to put a, a raised bed garden together, but once you have it set, you know, it'll, you'll be able to use it for years to come, and then the labor year after year is a lot less. To create a raised bed garden, it's similar to a, uh, a square foot. Simply decide where you want to plant it, choosing a site that gets the most sun, of course. Um, determine how big you want to make it, what shape you want to put it into. Uh, get the site ready, get rid of the existing grass, put down a weed mat or some gravel, then put the bed together. Um, you can actually either buy your own lumber and nail it together, or you can buy pre-made raised beds that just snap together. The uh, Gardner Supply Company of Burlington, Vermont, sells a lot of pre-made, prefabricated raised beds that you can just snap together. Uh, make sure the frames are level, fill them with your soil mix, and voila, you've got it. It's uh, all set up. Um, the last uh, method I want to talk about is container garden. I, sorry, I don't have slides for those. Container gardening is simply the practice of growing plants exclusively in portable, small size enclosures instead of putting them in the ground. Uh, container gardening has many of the same advantages as square foot gardening and raised bed gardening, but with a few additional ones. Number one, with a container garden, there's no digging and there's no tilling. You know, even with a, with a raised bed or a square foot garden, you've still got to maybe take your spading fork or whatever and work that soil. You really don't have to do that with a container garden. All you really need is a trowel. Turn the soil a little bit and it's ready to go. A container garden is virtually weed free, especially if you're using your own soil mix. What weeds you do get are a piece of cake to dispose of. It's inexpensive. You can buy, uh, you know, get, get a used uh, half whiskey barrel or something for a nominal price or go to a junkyard, get an old tire and use that and, you know, it doesn't cost a lot to put it together. If you want to get a little bit more fancy, there are a wide variety of containers out there fitting a wide variety of needs and locations. There are terracotta ones. There are fancy ceramic ones, you know, all kinds that you can get depending on how much money you want to spend. You can also make your containers mobile. You can either attach casters to them if they're designed that way or put them on a wheeled cart and move them around as, as need be. So they can, um, you know, if, if you need to move them, if, if the sun changes position, you can simply wheel it over into the next sunny location. Now, where are you going to put these containers once you decide that you're going to use them? 
basically any level surface is ripe for a container. Um, hanging baskets and window boxes are also a form of container garden. You could have a small uh, um, greens garden or beets garden right outside your window box. And so if you need a beet, just open your window, pluck one out, there you go. Um, if you want to get the greatest exposure, you'll want to use a southern or a western exposure. That'll give you the most sun. Also, you want to make sure that you have easy access to water. You know, if you've got like three or four containers, after a while it gets to be a pain if you have to keep dragging a water can back and forth. If you've got a spigot and a hose, it'll be a lot easier to, um, to, to water it, especially with some containers. Most containers, standard containers, they're going to dry out a lot sooner. So you're going to be watering constantly unless you want to set up an irrigation system or use self-watering planters. Now, just a few notes of caution. If you live in a condo and you're on a balcony and you're on the third floor, be aware that if you overfill your container, that water is going to drip from your deck or patio to your neighbors below. And that's not a good way to develop good neighborly relations. Also remember that containers look nice and light until you fill them with soil then they're not quite so light. Uh, you try to move them, you'll give yourself a hernia. Um, so make sure that once you, that you know, you're absolutely certain that when you stick this container somewhere, that's where you want it to be. Because once you fill it with soil and water, it's not going to be so easy to move. Unless, of course, you put it on wheels, then you, but even then, it's still kind of tough to push around. So just as a note of caution in using a container. Now, what can you use as a container? The answer is almost anything. There are dozens of commercially produced containers that can be purchased at garden centers or mail order. There are everyday objects you can use, five gallon plastic buckets, truck tires. If you have children that have outgrown their kiddie pool, use the kiddie pool as a, as a container. It's just about anything. The one thing you want to avoid is treated lumber products. And be aware that not all plastics made for outdoor use, or not all plastics are made for outdoor use. So if you have something that's not, and you try to use it in a container, eventually the change in seasons and the sun and everything will cause it to crack. So make sure that whatever kind of container you use can withstand outdoor conditions. Now, with the exception of the self-watering type of containers, all containers should have holes or slats in the bottom to allow the water to drain out. Also be aware that dark colors are going to create higher temperatures that could injure tender young roots and prevent the full development of the plant's root system. The dark colors tend to absorb light and heat and those containers will get too warm. So depending on what you're growing, you might want to use a lighter colored container so you don't get uh, root damage from the heat. Also be aware that containers made out of porous materials like clay, ceramic, concrete, and wood are going to dry out much more quickly than containers made out of plastic or metal. So keep that in mind when you set up a container because that's going to determine how much watering you need to do. All right, those are some of the basic techniques in small space gardening. Now I'm going to introduce you to some other techniques that you can use either in conjunction with what I talked about earlier or as a standalone. First one I want to talk about is vertical gardening. Vertical gardening consists of using trellises, nets, strings, cages, or poles to support growing plants. This can be a space-saving tool when growing vining crops like beans or melons or pole beans. Essentially, you can maximize space by planting shade-tolerant crops in the shadow. And we see a perfect illustration here. Here is a trellis on which they have cucumbers growing. Without this trellis, those cucumbers would just spread through your garden and they take up space, which you can use for other things. But by growing them up, you now have created some more space that you can grow a more shade tolerant crop. You can grow lettuce, you can grow other kinds of greens there. So you can see you've just maximized your space right here by pulling those cucumbers up instead of out. You now have more room for other things. Another great example of vertical gardening is growing on the wall. As you can see in this picture here, if you can, if you have a, a regular, say, containers or an in, even an in-ground garden next to a wall, 
You can grow some things on the wall like that and grow other things in the ground. So you've just saved yourself, you've just made more use of the space you have by growing up instead of out. Intercropping is another method. And probably the most famous method of intercropping was one used by the uh, Native Americans many, many years ago. Excuse me, growing corn, beans, and squash. Intercropping, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Intercropping is essentially growing two or more types of vegetables in the same place at the same time. Um, and so here is, again, is an example. This is the, the three sisters, corn, beans, and stalk, and, and corn, beans, and squash. The way they work together is the corn provides a, a support for the beans to wind around, the pole beans. The beans, in turn, being legumes, provide nitrogen to the soil, which enriches the soil and helps both the corn and the squash. The squash, the leaves grow over the soil, so they kind of cover the soil and they reduce the amount of evaporation, uh, loss of soil moisture, and so you don't have to water as frequently. Furthermore, the spiny vines of the, of the squash hurt the feet of any raccoons that try to crawl over there to get themselves a meal of corn. Now, in order to succeed with intercropping, you have to plan it out carefully. You want to consider the length of the plant's grow periods. You want to consider their grow patterns, tall plants, short plants, below or above ground, negative interactions with other plants, preferred season, also the light, nutrient, and moisture requirements. Here with the three sisters, you know, they're all generally summer crops. They all grow at about the same time. You know, you can start the corn a little sooner to get some height to them before you plant the beans and the squash. So it's all kind of a matter of planting. Now, there are several different ways that you can, you can accomplish intercropping. You can alternate rows within a bed. For example, plant a row of peppers next to a row of onions, or maybe a, a block of peppers surrounded by onions. You can mix plants within a row or mix plants within a, within a block, within a square foot. You can distribute various species throughout a bed. You can have long season, short season crops together. For example, radishes and carrots. You can harvest the radishes before they crowd out the carrots. Plant the radishes and the carrots at the same time, and then as they start to grow, as the radishes mature, pluck out the radishes, and now the carrots will have uh, room to grow. They have a longer season. Um, and again, in the earlier one I showed you, plant smaller crops next to larger one. Shade-tolerant crops like lettuce, spinach, and celery can be planted in the shadow of taller crops. Now, intercropping can help you maintain better control of insect and disease problems because pests are crop-specific. By mixing families of plants, you break up expanses of pest-preferred crops. It makes it easier to contain damage. Many insects are not able to travel very far to get to the next row of preferred crops. So as an example, if you planted a block of tomatoes all together, you get a tomato hornworm, that tomato hornworm's gonna have a field day. It'll finish chewing up one plant and it's just a short walk to the next one. But if you plant a tomato plant, followed by, you know, I don't know, some, some carrots maybe, and then maybe some endive or escarole, and then another tomato. Well, if you got a tomato hornworm on this tomato, and he's kind of finished with that one, he's got a long walk before he gets to the next tomato, and he just did not have the energy to do that. So by separating them, you can easily control the pests, and there's less damage. So that's an advantage of intercropping. Another technique is succession or relay planting. This essentially involves planting a new crop in the place of the one that is spent. In other words, let's say in your square foot garden, you've got several blocks of peas or lettuce. Peas and lettuce generally are planted in the spring. As you start getting into the summer months when they're mature and lettuce starts to bolt or produce a flower, you can remove those lettuce and the peas and now plant some corn in its place. So if you do it right, you can literally plant from March through November, and then maybe leave some stuff in the ground over the winter, and then come March, start the process all over again. So an exa a typical example, you have your, your, your raised bed garden. In the spring, you plant uh, your brassicas, broccoli, 
Brussels sprouts, mustard, kale, that kind of stuff. And, you know, you get a little bit of frost in March. That's okay because kale loves frost. It actually improves the flavor. Then you start getting into the warmer spring. You dig those things out and you start planting some little more warmer season crops, maybe some more lettuce or something like that. As you start getting into the summer months, you dig those things up, you plant some corn, some beans, some eggplant, whatever. It starts getting warmer, then you start getting into the fall months. It gets like late July, August. Now you start digging this other stuff up and you start planting your fall crops. Again, your cool season crops, your lettuce, your brassicas, etc. And now you're getting into October, November, you've got a crop of kale, mustard, whatever. You harvest that, you dine on that through December, whatever. Maybe you planted some root crops. You leave those in the soil over the winter, some uh, rutabaga, some leek, whatever, or some parsnip. And then in February, you get a sudden hankering for parsnip leek soup. Instead of trucking over to the grocery store to buy some, you go out to your own garden and dig it up. And voila, you have it. Just be careful what you say to people. Just say, I'm going out in the garden to gather some vegetables. Don't say, I'm going out in the garden to take a leak. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Let's talk about some basic planting techniques that hold true no matter what kind of garden you have. When do you want to plant? When do you start this whole process? What you want to consider is your average annual load temperature, and that's where this little nifty uh, tool comes in place. This is the USDA hardiness zone map. It's based on um, the average annual load temperature throughout, um, throughout the country. Here in your area, in, um, in the Traverse City area, you are either zone 5 or zone 6. It's kind of uh, hard to make out from the, uh, from the figure here. But what this means for you as a gardener is you want to make sure that you are anything you put in your garden is commiserate with the zone where you live. So where you get into trouble is let's say you take a trip down to Florida, down in zone 10. You see a certain kind of vegetable or flower or whatever and you think, oh wow, this is beautiful. I've just got to have this in my garden. So you bring it up to your zone here and you plant it and it doesn't grow. And you scratch your head, well, why didn't it grow? Well, because down in zone 10, that flower is or, or vegetable is only hardy through down to 30 degrees, 40 degrees. Up here in zone in zone five or six, it gets to be, uh, you know, minus 10, minus 20. That's way too cold for that thing, and it's not going to make it. So only make sure that you plant what gets hardy within your zone. Now, if you buy locally, this is probably not going to be an issue because no nursery is going to sell something that's not going to grow in the region where they're selling it. They wouldn't stay in business very long. But when you order mail order, or a friend sends you seeds or plants, you know, make sure, read the label, or do some research and make sure that it's going to grow in your region. Now, the good news is that you can push a zone in either direction. So in zone six, you could grow a zone five or a zone seven plant, and you'll probably be all right. I wouldn't push it any more than that. Two very important factors for a successful garden are temperature and moisture. We already talked about temperature in terms of the, um, the zone map. You also want to make sure you're getting adequate moisture. Generally, high temperatures are going to increase the ripening of your fruits and vegetables and decrease the quality. You know, it tends to be at high temperatures, your fruits and vegetables tend to be a little softer, a little maybe even mushier. Cool and dry conditions, you have higher sugar content and color in your vegetables. So generally, Hot and wet conditions yield fruits and vegetables that tend to be soft and watery, a little lower in sugar, and of poor storage quality. Warm and wet conditions are also ideal conditions for diseases, and hot and dry conditions can result in increased insect pest problems. So in your raised bed or your square foot garden or your container garden, if you can start growing a fall crop, these are vegetables which are better quality for storage. You can either, they're better for canning, or um, cold storage in your basement or 
dug in a hole in the ground or something. So just something to keep in mind when uh, you're planning out your garden and you're determining what to grow. Cool and warm season crops is something you also want to consider, especially if you're going to do something like succession planting. These are vegetables that differ in their ability to withstand different temperatures. And, you know, here are some examples. These are what's known, these particular ones in the illustration are what's known as very hardy vegetables. These are vegetables that you can plant in the very early spring, um, you know, four to six weeks before the average annual last frost date. So depending on when the average frost date is for your area, just count back four to six weeks and you can start planting these vegetables, either start them from seed indoors or set up a cold frame and plant the seeds there. You know, you can grow your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, yeah. Your, uh, your lettuces and things like that, your kale. And if you get a little bit of frost, that's okay. That's not going to kill them. And as I said earlier with kale, it's actually going to improve the flavor. We move on to frost-tolerant vegetables. These are not quite as hardy as the other ones, but they're still pretty hardy. Two to three weeks before the average annual last frost date is, is probably sufficient, and you'll still get a good crop with these. As you start getting on into warmer weather, you want to plant the more tender vegetables. You want to plant them around the average date of the last frost. Again, probably starting indoors. Warmth requiring vegetables. These are only going to germinate when the soil is warm, so you don't want to start sticking these in the ground too soon, because if the soil is too cold, they won't grow. Um, medium heat tolerant vegetables, these are great in the summertime. You know, these will tolerate a little bit more heat, whereas something like lettuce, if it gets too hot, it's going to bolt. It's going to produce a flower. Now, what should you plant? In general, in a small space garden, you can plant just about anything. Uh, you'll want to plant, although you'll want to plant more of the bush or dwarf varieties of some of these crops. Um, Many popular small space crops include things like salad greens, peppers, eggplant, tomatoes, beans, Swiss chard, beets, radish, squash, and cucumbers. Those work great in a small space garden. Now, if you want to grow things like corn, melons, potatoes, sweet potatoes, those are a bit more of a challenge. But even then, there are ways to do it. You'll probably have to set up a separate space there's a technique for growing potatoes. You can buy grow bags and grow potatoes in that. You can use a bin made out of um, rebar, fencing wire, and just do alternate layers of straw and compost and seed potatoes and build it up that way. That's a way to grow potatoes in a small space. But the larger size crops will be a bit more of a challenge. So you might want to stick to more of the leafy crops, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, those kinds of things work best. As I said earlier, bush or dwarf varieties will fit best. You can, if you peruse through catalogs or go to your local nursery and ask the nurserymen, they can probably point you to a bush or a dwarf variety of crops. There are bush beans that don't require staking. There are determinate tomatoes, which grow only to a certain height and then stop. You know, unlike an indeterminate one that keeps right on growing, that might be too much for a small space. But just something to keep in mind as you plan out your small space garden. Just a little bit about essential nutrients. I'm going to be sending a handout, a set of handouts to Betsy that she'll send to you. In there will be a list of all of the major plant nutrients, their deficiency symptoms and their toxicity symptoms. Use that as a guide. So if you see your plants looking a little not so well, you know, before you assume it's a disease or an insect and start spraying indiscriminately, use one of the handouts that I send you and make sure it's not a nutrient deficiency. Just a few nutrients I'll mention. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is probably the, nitrogen is probably the first limiting nutrient. Ah, pardon me. <clears throat> in a plant, you know, that's a major ingredient in fertilizers and other things. We spread manure in the garden to, uh, for the nitrogen. Now, if you grow legumes, legumes are nifty little uh, plants because whereas most plants cannot take nitrogen from the air 
and use it for their own needs. They, have, they need nitrogen in the soil in the form of either the ammonium ion or the nitrate ion. Legumes form a symbiotic relationship with certain soil bacteria, and the bacteria can take nitrogen from the air, convert it into a form the plants can use, and then put it in the soil, and then everything else around them benefits. That's why it's a good idea to plant beans in your garden, especially around some of your other crops. That reduces the amount of fertilizer you have to use. These little bumps that you see on the roots there, those are the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. If you were to take a cross-section of one of these bumps and put it on a microscope, you'd see these little bacteria wiggling around. Those are good things. Now, if you want to grow legumes, peas, chickpeas, beans, alfalfa, peanuts. If you've never grown them before, then you want to use something like these. This is a, these are soil inoculants. You either, in this case, just sprinkle it in the hole when you plant the seed, or moisten this, roll the seed in it, and then stick it in the ground. These are <clears throat> granular preparations of the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Once you use these, you don't have to do it every year. Once they're in your soil, they're in the soil. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this condition with your tomatoes. This is a condition called blossom end rot. It's caused by a deficiency of calcium. You know, when tomatoes are growing rapidly, they're pulling calcium out of the soil for their own use, for their growth. Then when they start producing fruit, there's a deficiency of calcium and the fruit comes out looking like this with these black, ugly, misshapen sections. To stop blossom end rot, you'll need a liquid solution of calcium chloride. And you can buy it in any nursery uh, under the brand name of Rot Stop. It's made by the Bonide Corporation. It comes in a ready-to-spray form. You simply spray the leaves of your tomato plants, and that will prevent your tomatoes from looking like this. A little bit about fertilizer. Fertilizer, a fertilizer is a substance that improves plant growth directly by providing one or more necessary plant nutrients. Now, there are many different ways you can add fertility to the soil. Probably one of the easiest is a commercial bag fertilizer like this one. If you've ever wondered what these numbers on a bag of fertilizer means, I'm gonna tell you. The first number represents nitrogen in the form of elemental nitrogen. The second is phosphorus in the form of phosphorus pentoxide. The third is potassium in the form of muriate of potash, or simply potash for short. Now what these numbers mean is that let's say that your, your bag of fertilizer tells you to apply it at 10 pounds per 100 square feet. Well, when you do that and you do the math, it comes out to something like 0.22% nitrogen is getting into the soil. Now. This is great if you've got a large in-ground garden, but oftentimes people find that if you're using a container or a small space garden that's much less than 100 square feet, once you do the math, it may turn out that all you need is like a teaspoonful of this fertilizer in your garden. And a lot of gardeners will say, oh, that's not much. I need more. And you wind up, burn, wind up burning out your plants. That's why I am not in favor of concentrated chemical fertilizers like this one. And yes, I'm going to say this right now, miracle Grow is poison. If you use chemical fertilizers like miracle Grow in your soil, you will kill the web of life in your soil. The soil bacteria, the nematodes, the earthworms, etc., etc., because you're providing nutrients in a readily available concentrated form. That's too much for the bacteria. And if you keep using this stuff, you turn your garden into a drug addict because you have to keep using this stuff over and over and over again. That's why I recommend organic fertilizers, slow-release ones made out of natural materials like peanut meal, alfalfa meal, things like that. The soil bacteria will chew them up and release nutrients slowly to the plants, giving it an overall even feeding throughout the year. Also, if you're walking through your raised beds and you trip and you spill a chemical fertilizer all over them, you've just killed your plants. But if you spill an organic fertilizer, no problem. You can easily clean it up and 
you're probably not going to cause any damage to your plants. Also, if you're trying to figure out how much phosphorus to use, keep in mind that you have to do additional math because the phosphorus is not elemental phosphorus, it's phosphorus pentoxide. So you have to first figure how much phosphorus is in phosphorus pentoxide and then figure out how much you're going to get when you add it to your soil. So that's too much math for me. Here are some natural deposits which can be used as fertilizers. These generally provide only one nutrient. So for example, limestone is high in calcium, but it's very low in things like nitrogen and potassium. Also, limestone tends to raise the pH of the soil, making it too alkaline. Sulfur, on the other hand, makes your soil a little bit more acidic. By the way, don't use elemental sulfur on any vegetables that you plan to can, because if you get sulfur on it and you put it in the canning jars, the heat of the canning process will cause any sulfur that's left on the plants to turn into sulfur dioxide, and that will cause your jars to explode. So unless you want to turn your kitchen into the <clears throat> jet propulsion laboratory, go easy on the sulfur and anything you want to can. Rock phosphate is a source of phosphorus. By the way, if you use manure as a source of nitrogen in your soil, if you overfeed manure, you're going to find that you're going to get lots and lots of nice green leaves, which is great if you're growing lettuce or endive or escarole, but not so great if you're growing tomatoes because you're not going to get very much fruit. In order to get your fruit, you need phosphorus in the form of rock phosphate because phosphorus is the nutrient that's responsible for fruiting and flowering. So if you use manure, make sure you're also providing phosphorus in the form of rock phosphate or anything else. Green sand is a source of uh, potassium. Some other organic fertilizers, bone meal, blood meal, those are great sources of nitrogen, cottonseed meal, soybean meal. Be aware though that if you use any of these four here, you're probably going to pay a lot more money because you're going to be competing with the livestock feeders who also use these things in their animal feeds. So basic economics, when there are scarce resources and you're competing for them, the price goes up. Compost, if you can build your own compost pile, that's a great way to bring nutrients to your soil. You can recycle your kitchen scraps, have less going in the trash, less going in landfill. Uh, bat guano is a great source of, um, of nitrogen. Kelp meal is also a good source of nitrogen. Be aware that because kelp is harvested from the sea, it's going to contain a lot of sodium, a lot of salt. So you want to go easy on the kelp meal because you don't want too much sodium and chloride in your soil. Sewage sludge, I have two words to say about as a fertilizer, or one word to say, don't. Because sewage sludge, even commercially prepared sewage sludge, can contain a lot of heavy metals, aluminum, mercury, cadmium, lead, and I don't know about you, but I personally do not want lead in my salad. And keep in mind that garden vegetables will soak up lead and aluminum and cadmium just as easily as they will nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Years ago, there was a product on the market called New Earth, which was a sewage sludge-based fertilizer, and one of my neighbors used it in his vegetable garden. And it soon came out in the news that that stuff was just chock full of cadmium. And that was the end of his vegetable garden. That soil was basically ruined. So, um, a fertilizer like melorganite, which is a sewage sludge based fertilizer, I recommend saving that for your flower garden. Don't use it in anything that you plan to eat. And that is small space gardening in a nutshell. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to, uh, uh, to come to the presentation today. Uh, what I have here is my contact information. I'll answer some questions in just a minute, but uh, in the meantime, this is my contact information. If I don't get to your question today and you want to ask something later on, you can email me at mark at greenthumbatureservice.com. You can check out my website for future upcoming presentations and classes. You can um, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Google, um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. You can link with me on LinkedIn. You can check out my blog. If you want to join my mailing list, I have a newsletter that I put out monthly. Mostly it's about gardening topics. Occasionally I'll talk about cheese making and mushroom growing. 
But if you want to be on that mailing list and get that newsletter, just send me an email and I'll be happy to add you to the list. Lastly, I have a couple of books out. This one is Gardening with Confidence. It's my first book. And uh, for a mere $6.50, it can be yours. If you want to uh, buy it, just um, uh, send me an email and I will send you my address. And just send me a check for $6.50 and I will mail you a copy of the book. This last book here, I didn't write it, but I'm a co-author. It's by Diana Todd Banks. It's called Maturepreneur's Talk, How to Have a Productive, Energized, Creative Life After 50. And she interviewed several people, myself included, people who uh, became entrepreneurs at the in their 50s and all the challenges and everything they faced. It's a very inspirational book, my story aside, and it's available on Amazon, so you can buy that. Or if you want to buy a copy from me, again, just send me an email and with your address and a, and a check, and I'll be happy to send it to you. So, again, I thank you very much, and at this time, I'll turn the hosting back over to Betsy, and we'll take whatever questions we have. Betsy, over to you. I, well, it looks like there's a couple questions. My, uh, Polly asked if, I'm going to say this wrong, but Polly asked if, I can't even say it. Can you see it in the comments there? Um, hang on. Just talked me, about it. It was let about look, super Let me bring up the chat. Hold on, it's, it's, totally it's a common, sort of. Uh, why am I not seeing the chat? You know what? Hold on one sec. Um, I'm not seeing the chat for whatever reason. Let me try this That's again. That's okay. Uh, can so you, read? You, you were just talking about... Um, Malorganite? Something. Yes, thank you. They're asking if that is sewage sludge. I believe it's, it's a fertilizer that is made out of sewage sludge. That's why I recommended saving it for your flower garden and not your vegetable garden. It's probably been safely treated and everything, but I don't believe in taking chances. And then Angela asked if what she should use on her blueberry plants for keeping the soil to the proper acidity. Ah, there are soil acidifiers that you can buy. Um, I'm not sure of the brand name, but if you go to your local nursery, it's probably the same stuff that turns your hydrangeas red. You can use that. Um, ammonium sulfate, I think that's what it is. It also provides the, the nitrogen in the form of ammonia and the sulfur. Or you can just use, as I said earlier, elemental sulfur. Um, be aware, though, that pH can be is not easy to change because if you remember your basic high school chemistry, pH stands for potential hydrogen. It measures the acidity or the alkalinity of a substance on a logarithmic scale from 0 to 14. 0 being extremely acidic, like battery acid. 14 being extremely alkaline, like household lye. 7 is neutral, like water. Garden vegetables like a pH of about 6.5 to 7. Blueberries like a pH of about 5. Be aware, though, that pH can be difficult to change because if you're going from a pH of, say, oh, 6 to 5, that's only a, a, change of, a change of tenfold. If, you're, however, your soil is neutral, say pH 7, and you want to go down to 5, now you're talking about a hundredfold change. And that's not something that's easily done overnight. You know, it may take a couple of years or so before you get the soil at the correct pH. So you have to add a little sulfur or soil acidifier, measure the pH, either with a pH meter or with a soil test kit or send it to a lab. And then you may have to add some more, you know, as you get it slowly. And horror upon horrors, if you find your soil is buffered, then that makes it even more difficult to change the pH. So that was a long-winded answer, but the short answer to your question is either ammonium sulfate or elemental sulfur or whatever the soil acidifier is, is made out of. So that's how you do it. But again, just be aware that your pH is not going to change overnight. Okay. Ashley has heard that potatoes are shade plants and full sun plants. What do they really need? Mm. The question is, potatoes are shade plants and full sun plants. What do they really need? 
They need what all other plants need. They need sun. Now, be aware that if you want to grow potatoes, potatoes take up a lot of space. That's why I said earlier that they're, they're a difficult plant to grow in a small space garden. So if you want to grow potatoes, I would recommend either buying a grow bag. You know, there are grow bags that are specifically designed for potatoes. You can use like a whiskey barrel with uh, slats cut out of it so that you can, you know, or with a, so there are some barrels and things developed with like a, a door in the side that you open it up and you can harvest some potatoes from the inside. So I'd, I'd use, a, whatever you use, I'd use a separate container for potatoes. Uh, Fine Gardening Magazine several years ago had an article, I talked about this earlier, about growing potatoes using a wire bin, fencing wire, rebar, rebar wire, and layers of straw and compost. Um, if you'd like, if you want to email me, I'll send you a copy of the article. I know I've got it somewhere. And that kind of tells you how to set it up. Right now, it's probably too late to plant potatoes, but you know it's something to keep in mind for next spring. Uh, that was a long-winded answer again, but I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Although, um, I don't know, up here, I think we probably, right now, within the next week, oh, we'll probably plant, plant potatoes. Oh, that's right. At least right. I feel, yeah, because we're, I mean, it was just cold a couple of weeks ago still. That's right, I keep forgetting. You're, uh, well, yeah. up, your area, it's, up in your area, it's a little bit colder. So, yes, you, there, yeah. there may still have an opportunity to plant potatoes. So, but I wouldn't wait too much longer. No, no, I wouldn't either. It is the first, isn't today the first day of summer? Today or tomorrow? Yes, it is. It is. As of uh, four of five forty four p.m. your time. Sweet. <laughs> My question was about tomato plants. My yes. tomatoes tend to split. Is that too much water? I'm sorry. Say that again. My tomato what? plants tend to split. The fruit itself, the tomatoes, actually split at the top. Ah, the plant, the the, the fruit splits. Is that too yes. much water? Um. Not necessarily. There are some tomato varieties that are prone to cracking. Um, there are other ones that are bred to be crack resistant. Many of your hybrid uh, tomatoes. So um, if you find that you're having a problem with cracking in your tomatoes, you may want to consider one of the crack resistant varieties. Um, again, I do a little research. You can probably, if you do a, if, if you do a Google search for something like crack resistant varieties of tomatoes, you can find good varieties to plant. If you go to the website of Totally Tomatoes, which is where I buy all my seed stock from, they list all different kinds of varieties of tomatoes and some of the descriptions there will tell you if it's crack resistant or not. But um, I water my tomatoes fairly heavily. And I grow the beef master variety in my parents' garden, and I have very little problem with cracking. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from anyone? I know it's kind of hard okay. to see your reactions, and no one's typing anything. So. Okay. Well, before everybody goes, uh, I don't. I'll stick around for, for a little while if, if there are any more questions. But I will leave you with this. When the gardener comes around and he's digging in the ground, the gardener is the one who grows it all. If you'll only look and see, I think you will agree, the gardener is the one who grows it all. The gardener is the one, the gardener is the one, grows tomatoes through the fall. And they're tasty and they're sweet, and you know they can't be beat, the gardener is the one who grows it all. The gardener is the one, the gardener is the one, grows zucchini through the fall. And he's happy just to share with his friends and neighbors there, cause his family simply cannot use it all. Yes, the gardener is the one who grows it all. Thank you very much, Mark. That was awesome. <laughs> You're welcome. Do we have any other questions? look like it. I think we're good. Okay. Well, if you have any further questions, you've got all my contact information up here. So feel free to email me and I will answer everyone's questions to the best of my ability. Uh, feel free to check out my website. I've got my calendar there with all my upcoming presentations. So if there's anything else you see that strikes your fancy, by all means, log on. And lastly, if you enjoyed this presentation and you enjoyed hearing me, then 
Don't keep me a secret because satisfied customers are my best form of advertising. <laughs> You're still the host, so you have to stop record. Okay. I'm going to uh, uh, stop record.